Hi, welcome everyone. Really appreciate you spending some time with us today. Um, today we'll be covering some cost saving strategies with our RCM cost module, um, specifically looking at our reliability centered maintenance program and how you might be able to contribute a, additional savings to your organization through using this tool. Uh, now, I, I realize it, it, it's a strange time for many of us working remotely and and I really want to emphasize the importance of you know looking for those key opportunities and I I commend each of you on on joining us on looking for opportunities to be able to you know add additional value to your organizations uh, especially during this time. And now before jumping in, I wanted to just quickly give a brief overview of of you know introduction of Isograph for those of you that might not be familiar with Isograph. Uh, we, we're going on 35 years in business, and we're one of the world leaders in the development of engineering software, and specifically, really, the areas of reliability, availability, maintenance, and safety software programs. And so Isograph actually has a, a suite of products that we offer, and we're a, a, a very mature software, and when I say that, what I mean is we're deployed in about 12,000 sites worldwide coupled with about 75 different countries. And just quickly, I'd like to, sorry, I'd like to start uh, by introducing my team that I've got on online here today. I've got uh, first myself, Brett Peterson. I'm the Director of Sales and Operations for North, Central, and South America. I've also got Joe Bland on the line. And he's our lead technical support and corporate trainer. And Joe's going on 17 years with Isograph. And so he's a, a great resource. He'll be conducting the vast majority of the, of the webinar today. I also have Clint Armistead, our sales manager over North, Central, and South America. Now, just a couple quick, just before we dive in, a couple quick housekeeping items. If you'll see on the, those of you that might not be familiar with go to webinar or go to meeting, on the bottom right side, you can see where it says questions. And if you wouldn't mind, just because of the, the group that we have, um, the number of attendees, if you have any questions along the way, please pose your questions there. And what we'll do is, you know, the ones that are pertinent to maybe relevant to everyone, we'll pose those questions for Joe throughout the, the webinar. And anyone that you know has some one-off questions, definitely feel free to ask us um, directly, either myself, Clint, or Joe. I'd be happy to get back with you after the the webinar. We're a very informal group, so you know definitely pose your questions. We'll, we'll get back with you and make sure they they get answered. But without further ado, let me just turn the time over to Joe Beland and share the screen with him. And we'll we'll dive in. And once again, I really appreciate everyone being on today. Thanks, Brett. Um, I've just started sharing my screen, so I'll give it a few seconds for it, for it to load on everyone's um, on everyone's end. Um, I want to again say thank you to everyone for joining us. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, thank you for joining us. I know this is a, uh, this is a little bit of a weird time. I know I'm working from home. I'm sure many of you are as well. Um, so thanks for your patience with that. If you um, hear any screaming or anything in the background, don't fret. That's just my kids. They're probably trying to kill each other or something like that. My wife has it under control, so don't worry. My I, my microphone sometimes is sensitive and can pick up the background noise. So again, thank you for your patience. Um, as Brett mentioned, um, please type your questions in the chat periodically. I'll take breaks uh, from the content I'm going through to ask if there's any questions. So feel free to keep them coming. Anything that's not um, <clears throat> answered during the webinar, we usually send out an email afterwards with all the answers to the uh, to the various questions. Okay, so uh, given that, let's just jump into the uh, RCM cost tool and we'll kind of take a look at how we can best use this tool to, well again, saving money is sort of the theme uh, these days. 
So let's see how we can use the RCM cost to save um, save organizations money. We have a lot of success stories with RCM cost companies that have invested small, relatively small amounts of money on this on the tool and the analysis, and then saved large heaps of money in um, maintenance costs and unplanned outages with more proactive maintenance policies. We have lots of customers who have these sorts of um, successes with the tool. So I'm going to run through a lot of the different um, uh, ways the tool can benefit you. Now, if you're a long-time user, some of these will be familiar, but uh, hopefully there will be a few new tricks that you pick up along the way. For the uh, webinar, I'm just going to go, I'm going to just use the uh, built-in example one project. So this is a project you have. If you've installed Availability Workbench, it installs this example one, and I'm just going to run through that. So after the webinar, or even during the webinar, if you have a second monitor, you might follow along to see if you can uh, keep up with me or uh, um, attempt some of these same uh, optimizations that I'm going to do. After the webinar, you can, when you're viewing the recording, you can sort of pause it and uh, and uh, work through what I've done on your own to make sure you're familiar with the tool. So anyway, a little bit of a background on this example project. This is a, a really um, a really simple example. Don't take it too literally. It's um, I'm not sure it's necessarily using real world data. It's uh, primarily made just to, to highlight the different features of the software. It represents a uh, plastic sheet extrusion plant. So we have various different assets and equipment to that are part of this extrusion um, of this extrusion plant. So we have like the extrusion unit itself, an air supply system, an electrical system, uh, roller system, monitoring system, all these different systems that are part of the plastic sheet extrusion plant. All of these assets can break. We have maintenance tasks that we can do on all the assets. What we want to do is we want to optimize that maintenance. We want to make sure that we're doing all our maintenance at the best possible time to minimize our costs of unplanned outage, but also to avoid spending too much money on the maintenance itself. So let's start with there. Let's start uh, taking one specific asset. In our extrusion unit, we have a screw feeder. That screw feeder has several functions, mixing and transmitting our material, heating the mixture and containing the mixture. The uh, containing mixture can fail that's the failure mode for that is the fails to contain mixture, the cause of which would be the casing leaks. And that's the cause that we're going to investigate to start off with. So um, that's what we're going to look at first. Now to optimize maintenance, optimization always implies a balancing act. We're balancing two extremes against each other. Uh, usually what we're, in this case, what we'd be balancing is the cost of the downtime of an unplanned outage versus a cost of a of preventive uh, maintenance. If you do too much maintenance, you're spending lots of money on maintenance without seeing a return on that investment. If you don't do enough maintenance, you could potentially have unplanned outages that um, might might have been uh, better corrected if you had um, if you had done more maintenance. So that's where RCM cost can help. One of the one of the ways that it can help. So let's take a look at uh, how we get that information for that balancing act. We have to know a few pieces of information. I'll just give a quick rundown. So starting with that casing leaks, we need first we need to know how often it's likely to fail. So that's the failure tab. We input failure information, failure distributions for this component. I'm not going to go for this specific webinar. I'm not going to go into too much detail on how this information is gathered. I can give some quick uh, answers. We might gather it from historical data. We might gather it from subject matter experts. We might gather it from our own experience. Um, um, how we input this data and how we determine that distribution is perhaps the subject of a, of a different webinar. But we start with uh, a description, a general description of the uh, failure distribution for the component. In this specific case, our um, casing leaks component follows a um, what we call the uh, tri-weibel distribution. We might better know that as the bathtub curve. Uh, bathtub curve models uh, component failure modes where we have early life failures, random failures, and wear out failures. Okay. In addition to the failure, we need to tell uh, RCM cost how bad is it if a failure occurs. And that's what we do on the effects tab. We can specify the effects of the failure mode. So this specific failure mode has two effects, a small loss of production and a material leakage. And each one of these effects can have costs associated with it, as well as um, severities. So for instance, this material leakage could include uh, criticalities such as safety, operational, or environmental criticalities. So we can measure the badness of a failure mode, not just in terms of its financial cost, but in terms of other 
uh, criticality values. Um, safety is often one that people have an eye on as well. So we want to know not only um, how much does it cost, but how bad is it, what's the risk associated in these other different categories that we can track. Okay, so again, and then finally, the last thing we want to tell our same cost is the maintenance. What can we do uh, to correct a maintenance uh, or correct a failure after it's failed? That's the corrective action. What do we do to fix the failure? Also, we can tell RCM costs the planned or pre uh, preventive maintenance. What can we do to mitigate a failure before it occurs? That's our plan task. And optionally, here it's uh, we don't really have um, an inspection task defined here, but we can also tell RCM cost if we have the ability to detect failures before they occur. So you can think of such things such as conditioning, mon condition monitoring, or condition-based inspections as um, uh, that might might be used there. This specific this specific project example, this specific uh, failure mode, we're only looking at the uh, preventive maintenance task plan task and what we'll tell RCM cost is basically how long it takes and what resources are required. Uh, we're going to ignore the maintenance interval for now. That will um, um, we'll come back and talk about that one later. The program will help us determine the optimal maintenance interval. Okay, so that's our starting pieces of information for our um, assets. How likely is it to fail or how often does it fail? How bad is it if it does fail and what can we do to correct and prevent the failure from occurring. And what RCM cost will do is it will help us figure out how effective that planned maintenance is and how often we should perform it. We do that through the PM optimization, which is this plot I have on the right-hand side over here, which we first saw. Okay, so let's take a look at how this optimization is going to be performed. What RCM cost is going to do is it's going to uh, try a range of different maintenance intervals. We specify the initial maintenance interval. In this case, uh, we've specified 730 hours or about one month. Uh, so what if we did ma maintenance every month? What if we did our planned maintenance task every month? Okay, and it'll run its simulations, its Monte Carlo simulation algorithms, and it records the results. Then it increments that maintenance interval by what we've specified in the interval increment. So again, by 730 hours. So now it says, what if we did maintenance every two months? And then it runs the simulations, records the results, does it again, increments it again by another 730 hours. What if we did maintenance every three months, and every four months, every five months, every six months, etc. It's going to do that for 30 different uh, potential maintenance intervals, ranging from essentially from one month to 30 months. Records the results for every single one, and then it will plot them. So let's do that. Um, I've actually already run the optimization on this one, but we'll run it again using the yellow traffic lights up here on the toolbar. And for now, we'll look at the blue line. Okay, we'll look at those other three later on, but for now I'm focusing on the blue line, which is our cost optimization. Okay, so to explain the optimization plot, the x-axis is the maintenance interval, and the y-axis on the left-hand side is the cost. And the blue line shows the relation between cost and maintenance interval. So on the very, very left-hand side, where we have a very short maintenance interval, that was our monthly maintenance, we have a very high cost for this asset because we're overperforming maintenance. We're performing, spending lots of money on maintenance on the spare parts or the labor um, or the downtime, if there's any of that's associated with the maintenance. We're spending lots of money on this maintenance task that does not, that we're not seeing a return on investment on that. Over on the right-hand side with a very, very long maintenance interval, so when we have a 30-month maintenance interval, we again have a very high cost because we have lots of outages. We have lots of unplanned outages, which could be better mitigated with a more proactive maintenance plan. The optimal maintenance plan comes right down here where we have a, um, an interval of six months, 4,380 hours. That's our lowest cost where we're balancing the cost of the maintenance versus the cost of the effects of an outage. So that's where we had the lowest overall cost. Okay. The other three lines, the purple, green, and red lines represent the environmental, operational, and safety criticalities. So in other words, there's not just a cost to the failure, but there's also risks, environmental risks of our um, material, the, the, the molten plastic, escaping safety risks that could hurt somebody, Presume it was very hot, it could burn somebody and there's safety risks associated with it, or it could start a fire. 
and operational risks, risks to the successful operation. So again, we have those di for different maintenance intervals, we'll have different risks. Sometimes you get that um, a scenario where the cheapest costs might be unsafe. So for instance, sometimes run to failure may be cheapest, but it might be unsafe to do a run to failure maintenance policy. So the criticalities help us catch that. And RCM cost will not recommend a, um, a, maintenance, a maintenance interval, even the cheapest cost maintenance interval, if our criticalities do not meet a specified target. In the project options, we can define criticality targets for our system, and then RCM cost will um, keep an eye on those targets as well. Those maintenance targets, or those, uh, excuse me, those criticality targets can be displayed on this plot as well. If I go to my uh, plot options, there's check boxes where I can show those targets, safety, operational, and environmental targets. And then it displays them as dashed lines on the plot. And you can see the red dashed lines for safety, the green is for in operational, and the purple is for environmental. And you can see when at our cheapest cost, we're also well within our criticality targets. Okay, so if I like that recommendation that RCM cost has made, I'll accept it and apply it to the planned maintenance for that asset, for that specific um, failure mode of that asset. And that will, uh, RCM cost will accept that recommendation. Okay, um, let's pause for questions here for any questions on that first part of our look through. Again, if you have experience with RCM cost, this will be familiar, or even if you've watched some of our previous webinars, you've probably seen something like this. But we'll, um, Brett, do we have any questions on that so far? Yeah, one, one question that was posed is, is there a way to bring information from your SAP or Maximal, you know, CMMS program into, you know, our program to be able to run the optimization? Sure, absolutely, yeah. Um, again, that would be another separate webinar on its own, uh, just downloading the data. But we do have an SAP portal also to Maximo as well. You can link to external data sources. Um, and when you use those in this project, uh, this example that I'm using right now is not set up for it. Um, but when you have a, uh, um, um, yeah, when you when you link that link up to it, you can download all sorts of information from your ERP systems, such as um, a list of your asset hierarchy, a list of all your assets. You can download um, work plans or maintenance plans. You can download equipment and spare parts. Uh, all that information, even failure modes, can be downloaded from those other systems and then uploaded into RCM costs. Uh, if you have a large system with, say, hundreds of assets, rather than having to manually define each asset in its failure modes, you can very much simplify and speed up your life by downloading that information. There's still always a little bit of information that has to be done within RCM cost side. There's some information that's not really captured. I know failure rate information is generally not stored in those other um, systems, so um, we might need to enter that manually, or we can um, the other thing that the portals can do is download a work order history, and we can use the Weibull module to analyze that work order history to come up with a failure distribution as well. Again, that's all for maybe for another webinar, but it is definitely possible to download information from other um, sources. Okay. Fantastic. Thanks, Joe. Sure. Okay. Okay, well then uh, let's move on. As I go through this, I'm going to be saving all my iterations of the file. Anytime I make a change, I'm going to save it as a different iteration. We'll come back into the end and I'll show you why I'm going to do that. But I've made one change. I've changed the maintenance interval for this specific asset. Okay, so let me start there. I'll, um, actually, I'm going to rename the project ID. I'll call this um, revision one of my uh, system. And then I'm going to save it, save my project as, and I'm going to create a new folder for all these. So maybe a plastic sheet extrusion plant. And we'll save this as example one, revision one. Okay. This all makes sense in the end. So uh, and just bear with me for, for the time being. Okay, so what else can we do? So we optimize one specific asset, or specifically one failure mode of one asset. Now we could go through manually for every other asset in the system. I could click on each one, doing the optimizations. There's also an auto-optimize um, for all maintenance tasks. I could go through the whole system all in one go and do the optimization. 
I'm not going to do that on this webinar right now because I, I ran it when I was testing it out and it takes about a minute to do and I don't want to just sit around watching the software calculate for about a minute. Um, on a larger system, it might take a little bit more time. That may be one of those things where you set it up to run and go get a cup of coffee. But there is an option rather than individually going through each asset and accepting the recommendation, you can uh, go through the whole um, system all at once. One other thing I forgot to mention with this uh, optimization is when we do accept that recommended maintenance strategy, we go to the, the strategy for this uh, for this asset. One of the things, one of the measures that we can get when I click the uh, evaluate strategy button here, is the cost benefit ratio and also the criticality benefit ratios as well. The uh, benefit ratio tells us basically how much improvement this uh, specific maintenance strategy makes uh, over a run to failure policy. The cost benefit ratio here is essentially it's the cost with this maintenance strategy divided by a cost with a run to failure maintenance strategy. So what this is telling us is it only costs 23% as much if we were to do maintenance every six months as it would cost if we didn't do any planned maintenance whatsoever. So it gives you an idea of the cost savings of that strategy. Okay. One thing to keep an eye on when you're doing these maintenance optimizations is you want to keep an eye on the target area that you're looking at because you might come across an asset where your cost optimization looks something like this an rcm cost is saying recommended recommendation run to failure and the graph the uh pm optimization plot seems to back that up we see a downward trend very high cost with short maintenance intervals uh and that just gradually slopes down with a higher maintenance interval and so that seems to justify a, um, a run to failure maintenance task. One thing we do have to keep in mind is we have to look at our, uh, we have to consider what maintenance intervals we're, we're looking at and consider how that compares to the component failure distribution. If we look at this drive shaft shears and its failure distribution, we can see it's two overlapping Weibull distributions. So there's one for random failures with a characteristic life of about 200,000 hours. And there's also a wear out slope as well with a characteristic life of about 44,000 hours. So on average, we'd expect this component to last, I don't know, at least 44,000 hours, maybe longer, maybe a little shorter on the average. Um, however, if you look at our maintenance intervals, the end of this plot is stopping at 22,000 hours, only about half of our characteristic life for this component. So essentially we expect a, a fairly long life out of this component, but we're only considering planned maintenance in the very, very early life of this component. If this component does have an optimal time, it's entirely possible we're completely missing it in our optimization. That's where we might want to be careful on our um, optimization options. We're considering 30 intervals from one month to 30 month, 30 months, but what if our optimal time came after 30 months? We'd be completely missing it. So this is one thing we might want to be careful with our interval range specification. I'm going to change this around to see how this can affect it. Let's say we're not even going to consider maintenance within the first year, because it's unlikely this doesn't really have an infant failure or infant mortality. So it's unlikely we'll need to do maintenance in the first year. And uh, we probably don't need to do it considered every month. Let's consider uh, only doing maintenance after the first year and every six months there, uh, thereafter. Let's see what that gives us. Select OK. Start the optimization. Ah, and there we, now we get something that makes a little bit more sense. You can see we have that downward slope initially, and then it bottoms out, and then it will continue to rise again as the maintenance interval increases eventually we'll reach a point where it's likely to have failed and with a more proactive maintenance policy we could have uh, minimized our unplanned downtime so you can see where it recommends the pm at 21,900 hours which i believe is uh, two and a half years so that's one year one and a half two years two and a half years is what is recommended uh, maintenance interval is so again i can accept the recommendation again i can check my maintenance strategy to find my cost benefit ratio. It's not as drastic savings as last time, but again, 35% savings, that's a substantial amount. So um, it's, it still might be worth doing. Okay. Any questions on that before we move on? Uh, and I'll, the next thing I'll talk about is task groups. Um, none, none right now. Sure, okay. So far we've been looking at optimi optimizing our assets individually oh by the way i should save this as a second revision let me rename the revision this will be revision two 
because now we've optimized this other one. And I'm going to save this project as, again, as revision two. Okay. Oh, did I actually accept that recommendation? I can't remember if I did. Oh, good, I did. Okay. Okay, so this is now revision two of the uh, project. Now, so far I've been going through the assets and optimizing them individually, go one by one optimizing um, each asset. Now, of course, that could be very tedious. I showed that um, auto optimize intervals for all tasks, and that will go individually task by st task optimizing them. But again, a lot of the time you're not doing maintenance tasks individually. On the screw feeder, we're not going to take it about one week to optimize one unit, and then the next week to optimize to do the maintenance on a, on the second unit within that screw feeder. We're probably going to group maintenance tasks together and create maintenance task plans. We want to perform maintenance on the whole screw feeder or on the whole system all in one go. There could be uh, some benefits to that. We only have to disassemble and reassemble at once. So we want to rather than optimizing them individually, we want to optimize them as if they're all going to be done at once. So I'm not gonna do this for the screw feed, I'm gonna do this for the air supply system. I have two different uh, failure modes with two different maintenance tasks. So I have my worn bearings on my fan motor, or my fan, so the um, air supply system provides high pressure air. Um, worn bearings on the fan could cause it to not provide um, enough air, enough air uh, pressure. Also, the fan motor burning out could also cause that. And I have two different optimization plots. But it, let's face it, if I'm going to take do opt, or if I'm going to do plan maintenance on this fan, if I'm taking it apart to replace the motor, it might be it will make sense to replace the bearings as well. So um, let's take a look at grouping these two maintenance tasks together and optimizing them as one. I can do that by creating a task group. So I'm going to open up my worn bearings cause, open up the planned maintenance for that uh, task, and create a new task group that both of these maintenance tasks will be assigned to. Okay, oh, excuse me. So this will be my air supply system. Okay, I'm not going to worry about the interval. I'm going to use the optimization to help me figure that out. One thing I might want to worry about though is the efficiency factor. By doing mo both of these maintenance tasks at the same time, it's possible that they'll the overall time would be shorter than if I did them each individually. This is usually because I save time by only having to disassemble and reassemble once. For instance, if I did the maintenance on the bearings and then I did maintenance on the fan motor some other time, the two separate maintenances would take longer than one doing it together as one single maintenance. So that's what the efficiency factor refers to. Let's assume that I have an efficiency factor of 0.9, which means it takes 90% as long to do these two tasks together as it would to do them each individually. Essentially, the efficiency factor is a multiplier on the task duration for the maintenance tasks when you group them together. Okay, so I'm gonna set an efficiency factor, assign that maintenance task a group to, the, uh, to that maintenance task, and I can assign it to the other one, and I'm gonna do it a, a separate way. By the way, this is just sort of a little shortcut. We can use the grid view to assign, um, to edit the maintenance tasks. If I go to the grid view, I can select my scheduled tasks, it's my grid table, and then I can view all my maintenance tasks, both planned and inspection, for my air supply system. All right, and then you can edit the tasks straight from here rather than going through the cause properties dialog. I can double click on it on a, the bar right here to open the task properties to assign the uh, task group or to assign this task to that task group. There we go. Let me jump back to the plot view and I'm going to scroll down to the bottom to where we can see that maintenance task group that I've created. Again, if I double click on it, we can see the task group properties. We can see the tasks that have been assigned to it. And we can do our same interval optimization. Again, for the same reasons, I'd want to set up my uh, intervals. We'll do the same settings we've used earlier. We might actually even look at weekly um, um, intervals, maintenance intervals. Select OK, run our optimization on this maintenance task group. And it's saying for the air supply system, our maintenance 
ask should be done in 2,184 hours. So that's about right there. So we had a very high cost of so do it too much, quickly slopes down, and then it's going to gradually start to slope back up the longer this goes on. I didn't do it far enough out to see how that, how high it will get, but it will recommend again that that um, task or that's an interval. So I'll select the accept recommendation. And now that maintenance interval is applied to both tasks underneath this um, the system here. So the worn bearings, so if you look at the maintenance task or the strategy. Um, oh wait, let me look at the uh, maintenance task here. Oh, it didn't get this. Oh, you know, it's gonna it's still gonna be reading it from the, um, so I assigned it to that maintenance task, to the task group. And then that value should get assigned to the individual uh, ones. I think I might have to rerun the analysis to get the whole thing up to date. Okay. Okay. Now the in, I'm not going to see individual optimizations for the individual failure modes. It's, and again, it, instead it did it for the task group rather than the individual failure modes. Okay. Make sense? Any questions on the maintenance task groups or optimizing? the task groups? Um, I don't have any at this time posed yet. Sure, okay. Again, we've made a different change, so let's save this as revision three of the system. File, save project as, revision three. Okay. Let's talk about some of the other optimizations that can be performed on our system. One of the other components that we'll see that has a very high contributing cost to our system is the, what's this one right here. Now, I know this from past experience that I've done with this uh, system. This power, um, this uh, um, failure mode here, power surge leading to fuse blowing has a very high um, effect cost on the system. The reason for that, well, it's an exponential distribution so there's a mean time to failure of 2000 and an exponential distribution. Exponential distributions can be hard to deal with because it means your failure rate doesn't change with component age, which means plan maintenance generally doesn't have much of a benefit. And we'll actually see that if we run the optimizations on this, you'll see something like this. It's just kind of da uh, dancing all over. This is just due to random um, changes between the simulations. There's no real pattern to it. And this is typical for PM optimizations on exponential distributions because essentially there's no benefit because we're not reducing the component age because the failure rate's the same regardless of component age. So this is one where um, PM's not really going to help. This one has a very high effect cost and has lots of downtime. Actually, if I think if we look at the strategy, there's an inspection task we can do, but that doesn't really have much benefit. Um, we do have a very high cost, partially mainly due to a high unavailability, which comes down to the spare parts. If we look at the corrective task, it requires a fuse, but we haven't really done any um, spares optimization. We find that spare fuse down here. We're not keeping any spare fuses on hand, so the capacity at level one and level two spare storage is zero. That means we don't keep any spare fuses on hand. If we need to order a new one, it's going to take a long time. It takes 480 hours to get a new one. So no wonder we have lots of downtime associated with this um, failure mode. It happens about once every 2,000 hours, and then we have almost 500 hours of uh, logistic lead time on the spare part every time it happens. So that's why we have a high, um, a high uh, um, unavailability. So one of the things we might want to do is figure out how many spare parts should we keep on hand. Obviously, we could just buy as many spare parts as we can order, but then we might be wasting money on spare storage, right? Eventually, we'll probably all use them all. You know, if we buy 50 of them, they're eventually going to get used, but where are we going to keep those 50 spare parts in the meantime? Um, so there might be a cost associated with the stores, something like a fuse. Maybe there isn't a terribly high cost rate, but if it's a large unit, we have to have a where we have to set it aside somewhere. We have to have warehouse space, which involves square footage, leasing costs, and things like that. We might not just be able to buy as many as we want. We might um, need to figure out how we're going to store these, and we want, might want to optimize our spare storage capacity. How many spare parts do we need to keep on hand to minimize the downtime associated with um, 
uh, the logistic delays of getting a new spare part when we don't have one available. And we also want to balance that against the cost of storing that spare part. So for this fuse, and you can see I've defined storage costs for both level one, which is generally thought of as on-site spare storage, and level two, which is generally thought of as off-site spare storage. Okay, so let's take a look at how many, and then of course for the optimization, we can tell it how many we want to consider from zero to two at level one, zero to two at level one. Actually, let's up that. Let's consider storing as many as five at each level and see how this works out. Okay, to do this, the spare optimization, again, there's a um, menu option, or there's also a plot on the right-hand side for spares optimization. So let me select that uh, fuse. I've set my range zero to five. So let's do our spares optimization for the fuse. Now, the way the spares optimization works is each bar represents a different storage level for number of spares at level one and number of spares at level two. The bars are also color-coded pink for unavailability costs and blue for storage costs. So it's balancing those two against each other. And then a red line that also indicates the unavailability, basically the probability of not having a spare part when you need it um, because you've run out of storage. Um, so the probably not having a spare part when you need it shown as the, uh, the red line. Okay, as you can see, the left side is really dominating this one. So that's where we have zero spare parts at either level one or level two. Let's get rid of those altogether. Let's um, consider one as our minimum capacity at both on-site and warehouse storage. Then I'll rerun the optimizations. And again, now you can see these other bars are starting to emerge, and you can even see some of the storage costs. The, bar, the blue part of the bar is starting to become visible. So you can see our big driver here is unavailability costs. So we probably want to make sure we have enough on hand. The program recommends spare storage of three dash three, that means three spare fuses at level one, three at level two, and that's um, beyond that, we're really not seeing much of an improvement in cost. We might actually see our storage costs begin to rise, and our unavailability is basically staying the same. We're not getting any lower unavailability after that point. So again, I can accept that recommendation for our spare parts. Okay, and then rerun the simulations to get a new cost for that um, power surge leading to, blow, uh, to blown fuse. Well, I don't remember what the um, what the cost was previously for the fuse, but I do know what its unavailability was. It was 0.22, so we've dropped its unavailability from 0.22 to 0 0.0005, so a fraction of the unavailability by just having more spare parts available by optimizing that spare part. Okay, so let me rerun that simulation now that I've, I've unchecked the um, plan maintenance. And again, we've optimized this one particular spare part. So we'll, again, we'll save this as a different revision. And then in a little bit, I'll just show you, right after this, I'll show you um, actual pause for questions there, and then I'll show how to optimize spares all at in one go. Do we have any uh, questions on the spares optimization, uh, Brett? Um, just a question on clarifying level one, level two, and level three. Sure, yeah. Yeah, so level one, level two, and level three is how we call them the software. They can be a little bit uh, flexible, what you mean by that. Um, level one is usually thought of or referred to as on-site spares. Those are the spares we have immediately available. Those are the ones in the, uh, you know, the closet or the, uh, where, or the, um, the storage room down the hall from where the equipment is. Level two, again, is usually thought of as off-site storage. You might, um, if you have several different um, locations where you have assets, you might sort of consolidate all their spare parts into one um, warehouse. That could be across town, maybe in another state, and you have to, you know, you know, you have to overnight it out from the warehouse. Um, I, one example of that is I knew one aircraft part supplier. They had individual repair shops at, at airports throughout the country, and then they had regional supply centers, regional warehouses where they would keep those um, the spare parts. So if the repair shop ran out of a spare part, they would order it from their regional distributor and basically overnighted it out, overnighted the spare part out. 
Level three is usually thought of as the manufacturer or the factory. That's where we need to, to you know, order a new one. So you um, call up the manufacturer and they ship it out and it takes, you know, say allow six to eight weeks for delivery or it's Amazon Prime, maybe it's, it's a, maybe it's a next day delivery or, or however it works out. However, you're um, ordering new ones, how quickly they can get the spare part. One of my users, again, their level three was they built their own spare parts. They were these very complicated uh, control systems for, I think, for oil wells. And so they had to be individually custom made and they had to build their their own spare parts. So their level three uh, logistic delay was something like six months was what it would take to build a new spare part. So again, what the what they actually represent can be somewhat flexibly defined by the user, but uh, that's generally the this train of thought that goes into them is, what, is how I just gave it. Does that make sense? Yeah, perfect, thanks. Sure. Okay, so we've optimized just one particular spare part. You can actually do groups of spare parts as a whole. If I go to simulation, optimize spares, I can see all of my, I get a new dialog where I can see all of the spare parts in the system and I can select multiple spare parts all at once. So I drive shaft, ball bearings, screw blade unit, controller unit. So I can select each one in turn. Um, let's just do a few of these. Um, let's see, the drive shaft, the screw blade, the fan motor. Uh, what else might I need? Let's just do those three. And I can set range for those. Let's say consider zero to two for all three of those. And then I can optimize all three of those. So you can see my drive shaft. Recommendation one zero. Let's uh, accept that. My screw blade recommendation of one zero. Let's accept that. And my what was the other one? The uh, fan motor was the other one I did. And a recommendation of zero one, meaning zero spare parts at level uh, one, one spare part at level two. So I can accept that. So you could do them all in one go, select them like this. The reason I don't like to do this is the set range. Different spare parts might be, need different ranges. So as I found out when I was going through this project earlier, the cable connections are used eight at a time. So I don't wanna set the range as zero to two. I think for that one, I set the range as eight to 16 or zero to 16, because you need it in multiples of eight. So if actually, if I, I can actually do this one, the zero to 16 for the cable connections and optimize that selected range. There you go, 16.8 is the recommendation. You can see there's too many to view. I'm not gonna try and look at the individual bars, but I'll accept that recommendation of 16 spare, uh, spare cables at level one, eight at level two. Okay. Again, I'd probably want to go through and optimize all my spare holdings that I'm that I'm interested in that I might be spending money on. If I have any spare part where I have logistic delays on it, um, I'm going to want to ask the question: Well, how many should I keep on hand? Okay, now that I've optimized the spare parts, we're going to again do a new revision. I've optimized multiple spare parts. Actually, I need to run the analysis to get the results up to date. Then I'll save that revision. So this is revision five. Save it as a new project file. Finally, one last way RCM cost can help us save money. So let's, I've been going through sort of uh, piecemeal, picking out um, uh, failure modes, uh, maintenance tasks to individually optimize or as a group optimize, picking out spare parts. I haven't really had an eye on what's the actual big drivers of cost. I've, I've, I kind of know from my past experience with this project, and you probably have a feel for your own some systems. You, your maintenance managers, or you uh, probably have, have an idea of where they're spending their assets. So you probably have a feel for it, but we might also wanna just get an ordered ranking of the contribution of each asset. And that's what we're seeing here. Um, the contribution plot shows me all of my top, excuse me, not all of them, my top 20 um, cost contributing failure modes to organize the bar chart shows them and they're also broken down by cost so we can see the cause of it the blue bar is the effect cost and in other words the cost of outage or downtime other ones like the air supply system we see operational costs associated with the maintenance or pink costs which are spares um, costs the air supply spares cost a lot perhaps but anyway we can see this particular failure mode tmp 1.8.1 i happen to know that's in my monitoring system temperature sensor, incorrect uh, temperature indicated because of a temperature sensor failure is my highest overall cost. I click on the bar, 
I can see that um, a failure mode and go through why that is. So let's take a look at the um, temperature sensor failure. What's going on here? Why is it so high a cost? Firstly, exponential distribution with a mean time to failure of 5,000 hours. So it's a fairly frequent failure. Uh, and there's not much we can do with regards to plan maintenance. Plan maintenance is not really going to help with this because there's no aging associated with an exponential distribution. And again, that's typical for electronics. Sensors and other electronic equipment often does not have a wear out curve. So our maintenance is not going to do much. The corrective task takes a temperature sensor unit and an instrument engineer. So one of the first things we might do is optimize that temp temperature sensor unit if we haven't already. So let me back out of this and um, do the optimization on the temperature sensor, just to make sure that we have enough. Um, there's my temperature sensor, set the range zero to two, optimize it. It doesn't actually get much um, by storing more of them. So we'll keep zero and let's see why that might be. Level one, level two, level three. Three, I'm surprised that we're not getting much by storing more of them on, keeping more of them on hand. It's a little surprising. I might investigate that later on why I'm getting those specific results. But that's not what I really want to focus on. The main reason this temperature sensor is costing us so much is because of the effects. There's a major loss of production. Plant, uh, major plant fire, because if our temperature sensor fails, then the system overheats and causes a fire, and a chance of a major explosion. So all of these are very costly, obviously, and very have very high criticalities as well. Um, so this is clearly, there's a design flaw here. We have a sensor that, if it fails, causes a major loss of production and a major plant fire, and it fails fairly frequently. So this is something we're going to want to investigate. Um, what can we do about this? We're Probably the issue here is we only have one temperature sensor. There's no redundancy. Maybe if we had two or even three temperature sensors, that would be um, that would improve it. That would improve our our um, system. So maybe here we need to make a wholesale design change and track the redesign costs associated with this unit. So let me take a look at the the, the um, temperature sensor. It has a mean unavailability of about 0.1. And again, that's probably the logistic lead time on those spare parts. So let's consider what it would, uh, a redesign. So obviously optimizing maintenance isn't gonna help, maybe even optimizing spare parts that didn't really appear to help. So let's just consider, let's, we have to redesign the system. We have to install additional temperature sensors. That includes a cost, but it will limit the dangers of our effects. The way we can take into account this redesign that I'm gonna propose, where we're gonna have multiple temperature sensors installed, is by modifying the redundancy factor, that RF on the effects. The redundancy factor is the probability that the failure produces the effect. So right now, one means 100% probability that a failure of the temperature sensor produces the major loss of production. If we had additional temperature sensors, then that wouldn't necessarily cause it. If one sensor fails, we still have two good ones, perhaps, if we install three of them. And so we wouldn't incur a negative consequence. So let's install two additional temperature sensors of which we'll say only one of them needs to be operating. And each temperature sensor I just looked up had a fractional downtime of 10% or 0.1. I click apply and it calculates a redundancy factor of 0 0.01. What that means is if we had three temperature sensors, each one with a fractional downtime of 0.1, there would only be a 1% chance that the other two sensors are down when this sensor fails and therefore that it would cause the major loss of production. Essentially by adding redundancy to the system, we reduce the percent chance that the effects would occur. So I'll do the same thing for the fire as well. I'll just type it in directly, 0 0.01. And also for the explosion, I'll even lower that by a couple of orders of magnitude. That already had a low redundancy factor, but now we'll even lo lower it even more. Okay, so for now I'm saying this redesign, if I were to install two additional temperature sensors, now our effects are less likely to occur given the failure of one of them because I have two redundancies. Now that redesign doesn't come for free. I want to track the cost and I say, I want to ask, is the cost of that redesign worth it? So what's the cost of the redesign? Maybe there's a, um, a million dollars in construction costs to modify our system. 
Did I get, no, I need one more zero there. Million dollars in construction costs to, to redesign the system to, um, to accommodate the two extra temperature sensors. And maybe there's even a, there could even be a cost rate. Well, let's just start with those, the capital cost right there. And we want to know, does, does this have a payoff? If we spent a million dollars to, to rebuild this system with two additional sensors, would it, uh, would we see a payoff for that investment? Now it's a little harder to see because we're not going to get that comparison that we would for say the spares optimization or the plant optimization. What we want to do is actually compare two different revisions of this project against each other. So let me uh, run the simulations now that I've changed it. And one of the first things we can see is on the contribution plot, we see that temperature sensor moved from the number one contributor to the number three contributor. It's bar changed from having very high effect cost to a very low effect cost and a, a big redesign cost. Overall, our system, um, if I look at our results, our total costs went down, but I actually, you know what? I didn't make a note of what it was beforehand, so I don't know how much it lowered it. Well, there is a way to find that out. There's a, an easy way to compare these two systems, the pre-redesign, the post-redesign. Again, I'm gonna save this as a different revision. So this will be revision six, a sixth and final one that I'm gonna do for this webinar. Save project as revision six. And now I wanna compare revision five to revision six. I can do that through the project comparison plot. Oops, that's, I didn't want the reports, so I wanted the plot, so sorry. I wanted the project comparison plot. I want to compare this revision to the previous one, and I can do that by attaching the previous revision as a library. If I go to attach library, find that other revision I had made, revision five, it attaches it as a library, and then my project comparison plot will show the two revisions. You'll see the different, um, normally the, the bars representing the different categories are like this. If you wanna see an overall co cost comparison, it's, um, usually easiest to stack the bars. So if I go to plot, I can say stack plot. And there you can see, get a little bit of a better view. This is revision five before the redesign. You can see the effect costs have dropped a lot with a little bit of an uptick in the redesign costs. But overall, the cost between six and five is uh, quite a bit different. So you can look in the, in the bar down here. What was this one at? Um, I can look at that cost. That's total cost of 1.6. E negative seven, so about $16 million overall lifetime cost, or rounded up to 17 million. Here we were up over, it's around $25 million at um, the revision five. I can add additional revisions. I could add all of my revisions to see the, um, just keep on adding my plots, revision four and attach library, revision three, et cetera. I could go and look at all of them and then that plot will show the cost that I made with each revision, the cost savings I made with each revision. I only added the first or the last four here. You can see how my overall costs were dropping with each successive revision to the project. Well, one last break for some quick questions and I have one last feature I wanna show in the last five minutes, how the, we can also use these different revisions. But uh, um, break for questions. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, just one question. Um, and you, maybe you'll touch on it just at the very end. What's the best way to, you know, pull these types of things into reports if you need to give it to upper management or to justify some of these possible changes to share this information? Sure. So you can, of course, use the report designer. This plot here can be printed directly. So I can either quick print it or create a clipboard, Im a clipboard image and paste it into, say, Microsoft Word to give to management. There's reports that show uh, you can print up a report of the cost benefit analysis. The CBR is the cost benefit ratio for each maintenance task to figure out if it's worthwhile. Um, you can print out reports of the overall costs. Um, management might want to know what's the difference between these revisions. So that's where we might want to be able to see what exactly changed between each one of these revisions. That's where we might use the project differencing engine. If I go to the um, tools and then the differencing, diff project differencing used to be a feature that was exclusive to the enterprise. Uh, module, but it, as of availability workbench version four, it's been incorporated into the base program, so it does not require an enterprise license anymore. Differencing allows you to show the different changes that you've made to each to uh, various revisions 
or versions of a project file. So you can take various different versions. So I can add my projects and I can add, say, all my revisions. I think I'd have to do it one by one. Uh, open one, two, three. I'll just add all six real quick. And then I can have the program show or highlight the difference between each one of these revisions of my project file. And then the final one, revision six. Okay, the differencing works, it kind of works by comparing what changed between each version. So I can choose what tables I want to include in the revision. This looks a lot like the export wizard if you've used it. Choose the tables that you want to include. We also have default option where it's just some of the most commonly used tables that you might see. So I'll do the default tables and columns. All right. And then I can perform my differencing. This might take a little bit because it's comparing. No, it didn't take as long as I thought it might. And then in my results, I can look at any one of those different projects or any of the different tables and it will show me the differences. So my spares for the each different revision. Can I just resize it? So here's um, for that particular spare part, it's identified by spare part ID. You'll show each different revision and the values in those different revisions, the optimization values for those two, All right? So for each spare part that I optimized, it will show me what the setting was, the level one capacity, and the level two capacity in each of the different revision files. So you can see between revision three and revision four was where I made that change. So what was the difference between revision three and four on the spare parts? It shows it here. For my um, scheduled tasks, what the, whether or not it was part of a task group for two of those, for some of the other ones, whether or not the task was enabled and the interval, you can see in revision one to revision two, I changed the task group interval for a particular maintenance task, screw feed, uh, screw feeder uh, 1A1, the drive shaft shears task was changed, I changed its maintenance interval. And also for the overall costs, so where are those stored again? Project? No, they're, they're stored. Um, Colors, headers. I can't remember exactly. I need to go through my um, through my different tables to figure out which um, which results were changed. But you can see the difference of um, actually. I think the causes might have a um, cost associated with them. But you can see all the different changes that were made between all the different revisions to your project. Uh, find out what exactly changed and export the results most importantly that might be what, what's of most interest so that you can compare what was changed what's the difference in cost and what's the most uh, worthwhile uh, scenario for our project okay any uh, questions on that any last things i should go through in the well, the remaining time we have any remaining questions i don't know i don't believe so okay well, again, if you do have any questions, if you think of any questions later, feel free to email Brett or myself. Well, we can answer questions via email. Any questions in the chat that I didn't get to, we also can have, we'll answer those via response email. Anyway, uh, I didn't really have anything else, Brett, so I'll turn it back over to you. Sounds good. Thanks so much for everyone's attendance today, um, as well as participation. Like Joe said, if you, anything comes up, if we can be a resource and, and help in any way, please reach out. I'm happy to help as well as, you know, have, have a great Thursday and a, a remainder of your week. Thanks so much, everyone. Take care.